About, um, about 100 years ago, actually, I was an embedded reporter in Iraq. And um, I spent four different extended tours in combat zones there and spent a lot of time with, um, with everyday soldiers and Marines and a whole variety of combat zones there. And so really got to, to be very familiar with the men and women who are now coming back to this country and entering our communities and our workspaces as war on terror veterans. And, um, you know, the stories written about these Americans as they shift from military life to civilian life often emphasize, I'm sure you've noticed, the, um, the troubles they're having or the things they can't do or the, uh, the stuff that, um, that they're unable to cope with. And um, some of the philanthropy offered to, to these veterans takes that same approach. Now, obviously, there are definitely veterans. There are clearly veterans who need help from their neighbors, and charity is all about doing that, all about lending a hand to needy people. But good charity is also clear-eyed and realistic. And I, am, I, I must tell you that the, the clear-eyed truth about um, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the typical veteran um, entering our society today is that they are not damaged goods, that they are opportunities to be grabbed. And your veteran's philanthropy should be shaped, I'd like to suggest, with that in mind. Um, Andrew Carnegie once said something interesting. He said, if you let me keep my factories, my really wonderful world-beating factories, but you took away all of my skilled employees, you know, within six months, there would be grass growing up in the cracks of the shop floors. But if you let me keep my employees and destroy all my factories, within six months, you know, they would have built bigger and better factories. And that was exactly my view of, um, of our military when I spent all this time with them. I mean, I really kind of came to the conclusion that you could take all of the tremendous technology and the machinery and the equipment that we give these folks and, and, and the very large sums of money that we devote to national defense, and you could hand that all off to some other nation, and they could not replicate the tremendously impressive military we have today because they wouldn't have the, um, the independent, you know, resourceful, talented, adapt-and-go service members who really make our, our military so impressive. They, and not the machines, are, are really the, the secret. Trust me on this. Um, so I, I, I want to just quickly tell you that the, my impression of my, my, during this time that I spent with all these, these folks in very close quarters um, was that they really have a far wider range of talents than you might realize. So I'll, I'll give you some quick examples. So at one point, I spent some time with a uh, commander who had just been assigned a brand new driver, an enlisted driver, and it turned out this driver had both a master's degree and a CPA. So the commander sort of looks at him funny and says, you know, it's not a good thing when an officer's driver is smarter than he is. So he's getting them known at the same time I was. And we spent several days driving around together, so we, they, they did a lot of talking in front of me. And at one point, the uh, commander asked him, he said, so you're a very young guy. He said, you know, what are you doing in the Army with this CPA and everything? And he said, well, you know, I'm going to have lots of time to make money but I wanted to make sure that I did one thing in my life that really made a difference, and that's why I'm here. I met a guy in Iraq named Steve Chesser, who was um, most of the way done with a PhD program, actually, at Fordham, when he decided he'd like to have a more patriotic and a little more active career, so he decided he would start jumping out of perfectly good airplanes with the 82nd Airborne. And despite all this higher education that he had completed, he did not enter the Army as an officer. He came in as a private, and I met him several years later, and he was a very, very competent and impressive sergeant at that point. I once shared a tent with a soldier who all of a sudden broke out in fluent uh, Spanish. And I asked him, what's going on there? And he said, well, I was a missionary, actually, in South America for three years. And this was a really worldly, very experienced, mature individual. And he, he was a rank-and-file paratrooper. Again, he was, a, he was a, I think, a specialist in his case, a very low rank. Another um, entry-level soldier from California that I got to know was probably not a, if I had a guess, was probably not a stellar book learner. Um, but I didn't have to spend much time with him until I quickly figured out he had a really fast native intelligence and was just one of these self-educators. And so, for instance, he had taught himself German because he aspired to enter the special forces. He thought that might be helpful to him. 
And then when we were talking, he told me he was uh, uh, instructing himself on battlefield medicine, which I kind of envisioned as some sort of first aid or something. But clearly more than that, at one point he started telling me he just finished teaching himself how to do an emergency tracheotomy on the battlefield. So not afraid of trying difficult things and, and just jumping in and learning. Um, I, while observing combat in the SUNY Triangle, I met a reservist from New York City who had a management degree from Oxford University, and he was running an incubator in Baghdad for Iraqi businesses for the Army. Um, I became very friendly with an incredible woman who turned down soccer scholarships at Duke and William and Mary and a couple other places so that she could go to West Point because she wanted to uh, become an intelligence officer in the Army. Um, who else? Oh, I met a military translator, this poor guy. So he just finished learning one of the world's hardest languages, Mandarin, at the Dis Defense Language Institute. And then the Army, seeing he had pretty good verbal facilities, said, would you mind going back to school to learn Arabic, one of the other hardest languages in the world? So this poor guy was so screwed up. I asked him what language he dreams in. He says, oh, don't even ask. You know, I don't even <laughs> want to talk about that. Um, I made friends with a guy named Chris Serino. <clears throat> oh my gosh, this is a character. So his, uh, he grew up in Long Island. His dad ran libraries, all right? And his mom was a French professor. But Chris was like a lot of young males who it was not his fantasy to spend time in a library with his hands folded learning French. That was just not his thing. And so he had managed to get himself expelled from high school. And uh, at age 17, he joined the army and he took a tour in Korea. And um, he discovered he loved running around in, in the dark and he loved blowing things up and he really had a good time. Um, much, much better than sitting in a library learning French. But um, he also grew up, and he, um, he went out and he got a GED, and then he, um, then he uh, actually uh, um, got out of the Army and enrolled in college. And he um, majored in uh, Asian studies, and he got a, a, a minor in Korean history, and he just got so into college and enjoyed it so much. Um, he ended up in four years graduating with not only a BA, but also a master's degree. Um, and he used to love to tell people, I can hear him today, he would say, I may be the only guy you'll ever meet that's got both a GED and a master's. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but he, again, there are lots of young men like this that just need time. They just need some, a little bit of experience with life and a little bit of maturity to kind of shift gears and, um, and, 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 and do that kind of thing. Um, and I'm telling you all this just to try to get you out of the habit of feeling sorry for veterans. And um, most of the time, I really think that all they need is to be embraced and to be encouraged and to be unleashed, really. That's the, the biggest favor I think we can do them. So with that, let me, um, let me shut up and, and, and unleash our two very impressive panelists we've got tonight. Um, Mike Irwin may be the only guy who ever made me feel some th sympathy for Al-Qaeda. He... Um, he was a star athlete at the Catholic school in Syracuse, New York, where we both grew up, that, my, that was the huge rival of the school that my son went to. So um, I witnessed from the opposite side of a field all the stuff that made him a tremendous soldier, stamina, ferocity, all these in, in, incredible uh, qualities as an athlete. And I was very, very glad, I can tell you, that our battles only lasted nine innings and that there were umpires on the field at all times. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have been doomed. But Mike then went on to West Point, and he, um, and then a, dis a very distinguished career as a quite inventive intelligence officer in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, he later attended grad school at the University of Michigan, and then he dreamed up and built out of nothing, absolutely nothing, one of the most impressive nonprofits um, serving veterans, Team Red, White, and Blue, which I, I know many of you um, know, which now has, I think, what, about 190 chapters around the country. Um, Mike has recently published a very interesting book, which I dipped into myself, um, called Lead Yourself First, and he's, in a, he's an authority on leadership and on character. Um, he's also one of the key instructors, by the way, at the Independence Project, which is the, uh, the effort jointly sponsored by the Philanthropy Roundtable and by Higher Heroes USA to, um, to try to make sure that injured veterans don't get stuck in our disability system. And in addition to being a prize consultant and an author and a, you know, a, a, an inventive researcher and all this other stuff, um, Mike is married and has uh, four children. Uh, so he does not have free time. Don't ask him about his free time. And he's also, get this, an ultra marathoner who runs 
ridiculously long races. I mean, I'm talking about like 91 miles in one case, and I know at least. So I don't know, I'm re rethinking this thing about crazy vets, Mike. I'm thinking there might be something to it, you know? But, um, and I'm excited to tell you that Mike is only half of the dynamic duo that you're going to hear from just now. He is here to converse with a man who has been just as uh, inventive and, and just as brave and just as successful in his own life and who created another spectacularly effective nonprofit for veterans. But I'm going to let Mike introduce our second guest. And so I just want to ask you now to please welcome Mike Irwin. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. And as I'm hearing Carl talk, and you can hear him talk about these soldiers that he was downrange with in Iraq. Mind you, that was 14 years ago, and I hear you talk about that like it was just yesterday. And that is one of the things that I think is so powerful about the opportunity to deploy. I have talked recently to Vietnam veterans who talk about something that happened 50 years ago, like it was yesterday. You can see it in their eyes, 50 years, and they see it like it was yesterday. So just seeing you talk about that with such passion is, is really uh, inspiring to me. Um, I have the great honor to now introduce my co-panelist here, John Bardis. He is currently serving as the Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In 2005, he founded Hire Heroes USA, which a lot of people here are familiar with, and we're gonna dig deeper into the history of that here shortly. Before that, he founded Med Assets, where he served as its chairman, president, and CEO. He also serves as the president and CEO of uh, Theratex, and was honored as the Entrepreneur of the Year by Inc. Magazine. Uh, John has served on numerous boards, including Scripps Health in San Diego, and USA Wrestling, and we'll talk a little bit about some of his wrestling background as well. Um, and he's an alumnus of the University of Arizona about an hour and a half down the road, where I believe they say bear down is their, is their big cry. He's been on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, um, and we're really excited to welcome John to the stage. So please join me in welcoming Secretary Bardis. Thanks, John. Thank you. All right, so uh, jumping right into it, um, We'd love to just kind of start off talking a little bit about Hire Heroes USA. So over the past 12 years, over 20,000 veterans have found meaningful careers through this organization that you founded. And you can see the slide here just talking about and showing you this, this growth over time. Um, when you started Hire Heroes USA, um, you were already, your th already running your third company, getting ready to go public. What was it that brought you into the veterans philanthropy landscape? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of times circumstance drives decision, right? And uh, for me, uh, I, w I was in Washington, D.C. at the Warden Park Marriott for an industry event, uh, and um, it, it was 2005. Mm -hmm. And it was a very strange circumstance. Uh, back in the mid-1980s, I worked for Baxter, a company headquartered in the Chicago area, and I started the recruiting program at Morehouse College. Uh, and I had grown up, uh, one of my friends is here, um, near the south side of Chicago. We, uh, my sophomore year in high school, we became integrated and it was a violent first year, literally violent. And then what came of it was a relationship. And it, as it turned out from that experience, uh, it was two African-American athletes and myself. We won the state championship in the state of Illinois for wrestling and we won the team title. And uh, it, it just totally changed our school. It changed the way we thought about each other. We got to know each other. And uh, it, it influenced the way I thought about um, a life in a lot of ways. And this young man, out of the blue, who I had recruited off the Morehouse campus uh, more than 20 years before, had jumped out of a car and he said, Mr. Bartis, Mr. Bartis, he said, you recruited me off the Morehouse campus 23 years ago. And he goes, I want to introduce you to my wife and child. I mean, I hadn't seen him for 20 years. And he, st he opened the car and there were these two beautiful children and his wife. And I, I, I was amazed by it, I was blessed by it. It was a great gift to me personally. And as I turned, uh, after I said goodbye, I turned to walk, there was a young man literally 15 feet away from me sitting on a park bench without a leg, white as a sheet, sweating profusely. Mm -hmm. And I, I was drawn to him and I sat down next to him and I, I just said, how are you doing? He goes, I don't, I'm looking for my dad. He, um, I, uh, he, he's had a meeting here at this hotel, and uh, 
but I don't know how to find them. And I, and I said, you, you, you've just come back, have you? And he said, yeah. I said, where are you? And he goes, I'm at Walter Reed. And long story short, it was real clear to me because I've been in healthcare my whole life. He was clearly in a fever. He was infected. He was beating sweat. And we had a, a remarkably interesting conversation at that point. Fascinating. Um, when, and you think about this and you start thinking about you know, all of your experience in business and in the healthcare industry. Um, you know, when you saw that, like what challenges, and not just them, but after then, did you see veterans face as they went from soldier, airman, marine, um, you know, to, you know, to the employed world. Well, you know, in this case, I mean, uh, uh, this young man's name was Justin Callahan, and he, I just sat down and started talking to him, and he chose to gift me with full disclosure. He just disclosed himself to me, and I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm not doing well, and I, I said, what do you think? And he goes, well, he said, you know, I'm really struggling. He goes, this is hard, um, and he goes, you know, I joined the service. I wasn't a great student. And he said to me, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. He, he even said to me that night, sitting on the bench, he said, I don't even know, I don't know if I'll ever have a date again. And as it turns out, my, um, my own grandfather uh, fought in the Battle of San Mejil in 1918, September 12, 1918. He charged with uh, Pershing's Amex American Expeditionary Force and was badly wounded, listed KIA. He was in his fifth country at the age of 27. And he was fighting as, as a foreign national for the United States of America. Listed KIA, what saved his life is he, he fell in mud. It had rained seven straight days before Pershing decided to assault San Mihiel, which had been held by the Germans, a mountain uh, in France, a hill, a large hill. I've been there. Uh, and uh, just to give you some sense of that battlefield condition, it was 24,000 rounds of artillery were fired in the air per hour at the beginning and throughout the Battle of San Mihiel. Uh -huh. It was so brutal that it destroyed the entire magnetic field in the battlefield. There were no compasses that would work. And back at the time, the privates would run to the next trench, right? And they blew the whistle, you go. And he thought he was gonna die. And um, he, gave his, he tried to give his wallet to the cook. And uh, the cook rejected his wallet, he said, his name was Anthony. He said, Tony, he said, you're not dying. He goes, you keep your wallet. He was hit instantly, uh, enlisted KIA. His mother got a letter. Uh, and he fell. And he, with, as it turns out, he woke up almost four days later, almost bled out. But what saved his life was the mud from eight days of rain. He found himself behind the lines, wounds completely compacted with mud. And he began to realize where he was, and he, he, got, he got a hold of an empty fuel drum and hid behind it and pushed it for three days. He was picked up by the American Red Cross. Uh, and during uh, his hospitalization in an American Army hospital, he contracted the Spanish flu of 1918. Survived it. He shook like this his entire life. Um, and he oozed shrapnel his whole life. Uh, he lived to be 96 years old, and he was my best friend. My father fought under Patton in the 95th Infantry. He was an ROTC kid from the south side of Chicago, went to Harrison High School, born 1924. So in 1942, when he graduated, he went straight in. Uh, they fought 26 miles apart, uh, excuse me, 24 kilometers apart, 26 years apart, just to give you some sense, right? So. Um, they had very different experiences. One was wounded badly physically, but he was jovial and happy. The Army trained him. He became a carpenter. He won the lottery in 1935. He got the promise of Social Security, and when he was 75 years old in 1965, he got Medicare. This guy thought he was dead five times, right? And so he was happy and strong and jovial. Lived to be 96 years old. He died in 1984. As I said, he was my best friend. My dad struggled mightily with PTSD, but we didn't know what it was at the time. My um, probably seven Christmases during my childhood as a kid, and my dad used to wake up two to three nights every week screaming, but he never told us why. Uh, we ended up in a place called Our Lady of the Lake in Dyer, Indiana, which we would, he, because he, he, by the way, I want to say some very positive things about this. My father, with the GI Bill, went to college, got his bachelor's degree, and became a dentist. My grandfather was trained as a carpenter by this country and went on to have a very successful life and got a pension. 
right? They both, in that respect, they won the lottery. But they both had very different emotional responses to the, what they experienced. Mm -hmm. My dad, uh, two, two nights before he died, finally disclosed to me what he had experienced. He lost all of his friends. The Battle of the Bulge, Hitler did a U-turn, decided that he was gonna try to break through the 95th, get back into Belgium and negotiate an armistice, right? So they threw everything at it. We didn't have radar at the time, couldn't get past it. Anyway, long story short, those two men completely informed my thinking around veterans. Uh, my mother is the last born and the last living of 11 Russian, Russian immigrant children. She celebrates her 86th birthday on Tuesday. All of her brothers, five of her brothers, were, ar were Army veterans. And what saved their existence was, during the Depression, the CCC program, the Conservation Corps program, and then the Army. Because when they went to war, they had jobs. And um, my Uncle Mike, who showed up at my graduation out of the blue wearing a Dago tee and a French beret, at the University of Arizona, it was the only family member that showed up, and he goes, Jenny, I'm proud of you, you graduated. I'm going, Uncle Mike, great to see you. Can I give you a shirt? Um, Is that he used to, vac I swear to you, during the wintertime, he'd leave the south side of Chicago where he was an electrician, and he'd vacation at the Tampa VA. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> so these experiences with my family informed my point of view of veterans. And when I looked at, when I looked at Justin Callahan that night, I'm like, I, I, I was really taken by him because in his self-disclosure, he, he really expressed his fear to me. And um, I, I, I went upstairs and I called my wife and to tell you the truth, I fell apart. I was really upset. I, I was hurting for this kid. I didn't know what to do with him. But I did say it to him that night, I said, I'm coming to see you tomorrow. What unit are you at at Walter Reed? And that's how this whole thing started. Wow, that's, that's pretty incredible. And thanks for sharing those personal details. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I often find you know, in my own time within the veterans philanthropy space that a lot of times people who are involved, they've got their own personal story that it comes back to, you know, whether it's family or whether it's someone that they've interacted with or someone that they went to high school with or someone you know, powerful there. Um, can you share a little bit, so as Thomas Meyer reminded us you know, in our session before here, you know, the field of veterans philanthropy is relatively young, this idea of foundations investing in veterans. Um, when you think about 2005, right, in many ways, 05, 06, it kind of feels like looking back, at least for me, is the Wild West. I mean, it was high op tempo in Iraq, Afghanistan not as much, but like, there was a lot of focus on the challenges that we had in Iraq, and this would love to hear your thoughts as you were getting this organization off the ground. What, what was it like in those early days when, again, there wasn't a whole lot of philanthropic support, and how are you gonna make this a sustainable business model? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, to be very direct with you up front, I was a failure at it. I did not know how to manage a veteran's charity. Uh, what I did is I threw my personal resources at it and decided to hire this kid. And um, I, he stayed at our house, and I got him a job with us, and what really informed my view of him was what I learned about his uh, fellow wounded veterans. And I taught, as it turned out, you want to talk about um, fate, I knew his father. I actually knew his dad from the industry I'm in. And his father told me a story about when they brought him to Walter Reed. They bring him from Ramsden Air Force Base. And he, go, and he said, half of these kids don't make it. But what they do is they stand the parents up on the balcony. The kids can't see them. And the parents either get one last look at their, ch their child, their son, uh, and say goodbye to them, uh, or uh, they help them along the way to get rehab. But they never let the, the soldier, the Marine, or the airman see the parents, because when they see their parents, they fall apart. Yeah. Uh, which, that struck me so powerfully, uh, because it was not only the, what he had been through and what his parents were going through and what they might go through, uh, but also this extraordinary human endurance that they had to deal with in order to get through what was next. And when I went to Walter Reed, what I, I saw one kid who had lost an arm and both legs. He had two kids at home and his wife was there and she was cheering him on in his rehabilitation in his bed. And I was completely taken with the, the attitude, yeah. the overwhelming commitment to getting out of there and making a success of it. So it, that also informed my point of view. 
what happened after that was something rather extraordinary. I got a telephone call from a friend who was in Bethesda Naval, where he had met a Marine Sergeant Sniper who was in the, the original battle for Fallujah. His name was Oscar Cannon. And Cannon uh, was in a full firefight, and one of his men had run across an alleyway and gotten shot mortally and cried out to Cannon, said, Sergeant, don't let me die here. And Cannon grabbed him up and drug him to a wall and returned fire and took out three or four enemy combatants, and they had put an IED in that wall and they blew it. As it turns out, they blew the front half, it blew the front half of his left side off. And um, he went through 77 reconstructive surgeries. And this man called me because the young sergeant said to him, he said, what do you want? He says, I don't want anything. He goes, I want you, please let my men know that they're cared about back home. Could somebody send them something? We started the Oscar Cannon Military Care Package Program, which to this day has been over 40,000 packages, which are about the si each package is about the size of the, uh, the chair. I'm going somewhere with this. So I, uh, I told Oscar, I said, Oscar, if you get out, when you get out of here, you're going to come to my house. So he came to our home and stayed with me in the summer of 2006. He was drugged out. He was on Ambien at night. He was on hydrocodone. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to talk to him even, right? But it was Justin Callahan who was with us with Higher Heroes who came over the house, and what he said to him was, get off your ass and stop whining and stop complaining and be a man. And, because I couldn't say that, right? Only another wounded veteran could say something like that, right? But we committed to do the Marine Corps Marathon in a wheelchair uh, with Team Achilles, Octo October of 2006, and we did it. He made it. Um, the long story short about this kid, he not only committed, the Marine Corps wouldn't let him back in, but he became a military police officer, and he went back to Baghdad. 77 reconstructive surgeries. First generation American earned his citizenship. His mother speaks Spanish. And while patrolling on a rooftop, he gets shot three times, jumps off of it, and re-injures his reconstructive surgery. Goes to Pendleton. He's at Pendleton, and he gets over bolused potassium because they don't mix the bag, and he goes into bradycardia and dies February 15, 2012. Went to his military funeral at uh, Arlington. And I'll never forget, though, what he decided to do because of what Callahan told him to do. And that was, you can do it. You can change your life, you can get off the drugs, you can figure out what you're gonna do. And that became the mantra, but the truth of the matter is around higher heroes, and I wanna express this very clearly. We didn't get off the ground, we were no good under my leadership. We only got good when we hired a military veteran. And that was Brian Stan, who was a Silver Star uh, awarded Marine, Naval Academy graduate, mm -hmm. UFC fighter. And you wanna talk about the world being circular and connected? Oscar Cannon's commanding officer in the battle for Fallujah ended up being Brian Stan's commanding officer in Ramadi. And I had coached in the UFC for 20 years. I'd been involved in wrestling and mixed martial arts. And he called me and asked me to coach Brian Stan. And that's how Higher Heroes ultimately became successful because of that connection. Because he knew what to do. He knew how to speak to veterans. He understood veterans' issues. Every system that you see today was built by him and Nate Smith. So I, I uh, the only thing that we did is we just said yes. Yeah. Everything else was done by people who knew what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. So can, speaking of, so thinking about Higher Heroes USA, can you talk a little bit about just the philosophy? Like, so what is the philosophy that underpins the organization that has propelled it? And I get the, obviously the people side of it is, is obviously huge, right? Who you hire and who you bring in is always important to any organizational success. but. What is the philosophy that is sort of baked into the DNA of the organization that has made it so successful? Well, it's you. Yeah. It's like, it's you. Yeah. It's what you're like, yeah. right? It's, there's no mission that, that you can't accomplish. Uh, there's no veteran, regardless of their background or circumstance, that doesn't have the ability to fulfill their potential as an American, given the fact that we live in the greatest nation that has ever been. That what you've learned in your military service makes you more than qualified to be a successful citizen. Yeah. Uh, that there's a place for you, 
Uh, what we learn early on in this process is, is that people need lily pads of hope to jump onto because the biggest risk that any of us face in anything that we're prepared to do in life or thinking about doing in life is fear. Anybody ever faced fear? Didn't think you could do it? I have lots of times. Um, the only thing that ever got me through it was just jumping. And sometimes it was a coach. Sometimes it was a teacher or a mentor who just said, just, man, you got to do this. And sometimes it was just a kick in the butt. But our, our military veterans have extraordinary capacity, extraordinary capability. We've seen what they can do. They rebuilt the entire planet after World War II. The Marshall Plan, right? Rebuilding Japan. This country rebuilt the rest of the entire world and then handed it back to the rest of the world. We patrol the seas, which allow 94% of all shipments economically in this world to happen for free, right? Who does that? A free nation that has been led by the sacrifice of military veterans who have been prepared to write a check up to including their life to serve this idea that represents the highest thoughts of mankind. So what we find is when they have hope and they have leadership that allows them to jump from one lily pad to the next, they eventually find a sidewalk and they eventually find a highway and then they get a vehicle and they start rocking. But they got to get through that period of time against all odds, which in some cases are odds that are created by our own federal government or by society's view of what you can't do. Sometimes we think we solve people's problems by telling them what we're going to do for them. That doesn't solve this problem, and it doesn't unlock the potential of what veterans are all about. They are technically proficient. They are incredible team players. They are tougher than you can possibly imagine, and I don't mean that in a mean way. They endure. Yeah. No, and, and I used, obviously, knowing so many people who have served, I, I certainly agree wholeheartedly. Um, I also just want to take a few minutes to share a few thoughts, because uh, I've had the opportunity over the past couple of years to work with the round table and with Thomas, and. Um, working on this concept that you've heard a little bit about tonight called the Independence Project. And the Independence Project is really predicated upon this idea that very often when an active duty service member is injured, um, it could be service connected, uh, it could be from combat, that they then rely upon those ongoing benefits for the rest of their life. And the idea behind the Independence Project, which I'll get to in a minute and how it integrates so well with Hire Heroes USA, is that if we have the capacity to take those soon-to-be veterans, to give them some really up-close and personal attention, like Hire Heroes USA is so effective at doing, able to talk to them about how their military experiences in life transitions well to the civilian world, so long as they're willing to start to embrace their own values and to understand that the outside the military world is a little more chaotic and uncertain, perhaps, than what they experience in the military that they can go on and create businesses and do incredible things with their professional lives. And just to share a few stats, I'm talking to Ross Dickman, who is uh, the director of this, 64%, um, which is a total of 43 of the veterans who've gone through the initial pilot earlier this year have already been hired. Uh, and the average starting salary is $60,115. Um, which we know the average median salary in the country today is around 52,000. So a significant one plus standard deviation from the mean in terms of the successful starting point. Now I've had the honor and the opportunity in this to work with Hire Heroes USA, and I've led a day session where we help these soon to be veterans reflect upon their values and think about their military experience and how they can take those lessons learned, especially from places like Iraq and Afghanistan, to prepare them and give them the confidence that they need to move on with their life. And so I guess my question on uh, this for you, John, would be why the Philanthropy Roundtable and Hire Heroes USA partnership on this? Why does it seem like, at least to me, um, from the outside looking in, was this such a natural fit for this uh, pilot, which hopefully will go on to become uh, even more effective as it starts to scale? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I want to say thank you to you, and I want to say thank you to you, Thomas. And I want to say thank you to each of you. You represent organizations that, in my view, are part of what is the best in America. Great ideas, great ideals, great success, then rechanneled back to this concept of serving other people. Uh, the enormous amount of resource that's in this room and what you do with it is nothing short of stunning. It is, frankly, in my view, uh, 
a reflection of Judeo-Christian values that are fascinating. They're powerful, they're, e they're eternal, they're self-perpetuating. Um, I think uh, this investment and, and these veterans is consistent with, with what I believe or I want to believe your value system and our value system as a nation mm -hmm. is all about. And that is uh, we provide a hand up, not a hand out, so that those who live within this idea, this human potential idea, uh, can become what our founding fathers fought so hard for this nation to represent. Uh, and um, I, I will tell you, um, for those of you, many of you travel, I know throughout the world, we are, we are, in terms of the human race, the light of the world. We're the bat, the, as Lincoln put it, and we remain this today, the last best hope on the planet. And I believe that what you do and what you choose to do every day and what we choose to do together remains our test in this idea. And I think this idea is alive and well. Four years ago last month, Vladimir Putin wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal in which he cautioned Americans not to think about Russian exceptionalism, or American exceptionalism. Does anybody remember that op-ed piece? What a joke. If he couldn't be more blind than he already is, he proved it that day. Because he coined American exceptionalism as a national concept, when in fact the idea is around the potential of human beings. Now, I served on the board of the United States Anti-Doping Agency for eight years, and here's the connection. Putin was doping his athletes mightily. He wrote that op-ed piece with an idea in mind, that through the doping of his athletes for Sochi, they would have a fine performance and he would justify his commentary around American exceptionalism as if he actually knew what that meant. Of course, we caught him, right, because he doesn't believe in Russian exceptionalism, because freedom is not a game plan for them. Human potential is not part of what they think about. It's not that Russians don't have it, they have it in spades, but they're not allowed the opportunity. What makes the difference in this country every day is people like you who have lived the American ideal and have benefited from it and then have come back to its principles and its foundation and ensured that the next generation accepts the baton that you have been so generous to offer to them. Our veterans are a giant portion of that idea. They represent what is best in us not what's middle of the road for us. They represent what is best in us. And the fact that many of you have stepped up to the, to the occasion here to support our veterans and maybe even hire heroes is just yet another reflection of this idea passed from generation to generation that makes it possible for us to hand to our children the promises that our own parents and grandparents handed to us. And so for that, I'm very grateful. I thank you for that. Um, so, Carl mentioned this a little bit, but about four months ago, I, I co-authored a book, um, came out um, called Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. Co-author is a uh, federal judge from the Sixth Circuit, Ray Kethledge, and, uh, and because so many people in here burn so hot and you know, flying here and going there and, and on the go and a lot of inbound requests and demands for your time, um, and you certainly fall into that category, not just in your current role, but even you know, over these past, especially 15 years, as technology has accelerated, I, I would love to just hear your reflections and thoughts about with the pace of life and with all the demands and the pressures to be certain places and do certain things, like how do you find a balance in life? How, how do you find time to, or do you find that time to reflect, the time to slow things down, to uh, go a little smoother, smooth is slow, slow, or slow is smooth, smooth is fast, yeah. that kind of stuff. And I'm just curious more than anything, because you know, wrote the whole book um, focused on this subject, and especially in a room of people who've got so many things on their plate, like how do you manage that with all the demands on your time? Well, I, you know, I don't have a, I wish I did, and um, I don't have an answer for every person around how to make your life more productive. I do believe this, and uh, at the risk, I'm, I'm not attempting to be religious in any way, shape, or form, but I don't believe any society, any group of people, any country could ever rise above its concept of who God is. Uh, I think that that as we honor God and choose to, um, to live lives and operate as a nation according to his principles, it's my opinion 
that our nation will remain in fine shape. I think also our lives go the same way. Uh, I think that uh, by making sure that we make time for him, our creator, that he uh, becomes the centerpiece of our lives, that the glory of who he really is and what he's, what he's really about is something that penetrates the heart of each individual. It's not a religious experience for a group, but it's rather what's inside of you. I think that when people do that and that the mm -hmm. parents teach their children to think in those terms, uh, our society is in great shape. I think when we lose touch with that, our society has trouble, and I think we as individuals have trouble. Uh, and I'm only speaking for myself. When I get out of sorts, I'm out of touch with him. Um, when I'm back in the right place, I'm back in contact with him. And by the way, sometimes that fluctuates in 18-hour periods of time. I have often been out of control all over the place, answering calls and things that I should not uh, uh, be dealing with in relationship to other responsibilities, and I try to get it back on track because I'm a flat mess. Um, but I, the only thing that gets me on track again is to get back to that place. That's just me. Good. No, thank you. Um, and we got time for just a couple more um, questions. Yeah. A um, couple, couple more questions. Um, so uh, I lead a nonprofit organization called the Positivity Project, and the, really the focus is on uh, empowering America's youth to build strong relationships through a deeper understanding of character. And I'd love to just hear your reflections upon the role that you think, especially growing up, that wrestling played for you in terms of character development. Because one of the things we see is that, especially from a young age, if you're able to build your character and have experiences that help you to grow, um, that it can pay these dividends for you longer longer term in your life. And so we'd just love to hear you know, your reflections as you think back, you know, many years ago when you were a young kid and, and, and yeah. you know, what did wrestling or what did sports in general do for your character? Yeah, well, first of all, it saved me in many ways. I mean, it gave me something that I felt I could be part of. I had great coaches. Uh, my high school coach was a two-time collegiate All-American. My college coach, who I did his eulogy two weeks ago, died at 91, was a three-time NCAA champion and Olympian. Uh, I was blessed to be around incredible people, people who were far better than I as a, as a person and, and as a wrestler. But it gave me purpose. Uh, it gave me a place to be. It gave me something that allowed me to identify myself. Um, and the other thing it gave me was a test of character. Wrestling's hard. We don't play it. You cut weight. You work out. We decided we wanted to be good when we were in high school. I was lucky enough to make the varsity as a freshman, and I was captain my junior and senior year. And um, the only way to be good is you have to be solid technically, but you better be in shape. And so you better get your conditioning out of the way, because without it, all that technique doesn't matter. But I remember we used to get up uh, three, three mornings a week at 5, and we'd show up at school at 6, and we'd run seven miles in the middle of winter so our conditioning could be out of the way. Uh, so that we could do our technique and work hard and, and beat the hell out of each other in the afternoon. Um, and so uh, it was a great learning experience for me because when I came out of school, I didn't know if I was uh, intelligent or capable or, ca or able to do anything. The only thing I knew for sure, at least I believed, it may, it was that it, I, I believed in my heart I could outwork anybody, I, that I'd be willing to pay the price, no matter what that price was. Uh, to be successful uh, at, at, at any level. I didn't know what level I would get to, but that yeah. whatever task I was given, I would not fail because I didn't want to work. Wrestling allowed me to learn about that work ethic. There was just no shortcuts, right? You're in the middle of the third period, if you're not in shape, it's pretty obvious, right? So wrestling was a great blessing, and I could go on and on and on. My roommate in college was the best wrestler of my generation, three-time world champion. Um, and w I was alternate on the Olympic team in 1976. We both were, but he was really better. He was the same weight class, but a different style. I was Greco-Roman. He made the 80 Olympic team as two-time defending world champion, and we boycotted. One of the worst decisions our government ever made. We penalized our best people, right? You don't do that, but uh, that's in the past. Uh, he had a hard life thereafter for many reasons, but uh, you talk about life being circular. I was named team leader in 08, and I asked if he would consider being the assistant coach, and he was, and here we were, uh, friends at the age of 18, here we were 40 years later marching in the Beijing Games in 2008 representing our country. What I want to tell you is this, and this isn't about wrestling, but this is about the United States. We were called to a meeting by President Bush in 2008 in Beijing early. He wanted to meet with us, and we went to the uh, fencing center to do so. Mm -hmm. For those of you who hear throughout the world that America is not respected, that is complete bull. 
When we walked through the Olympic Village, we dressed three hours early. I remember walking with Misty May Trainer and Kerry Walsh, our team, and the entire village stood down. You know why? Because they know we're them, and we represent their countries. Our grandparents came over, our great-grandparents. There is huge respect for the United States. And I'll tell you, one of the greatest experiences of my life was that the night before the opening ceremonies of every Olympic Games, the team captains vote on who carries the flag. By the way, the greatest honor you could possibly have is carrying your flag in the opening ceremonies, right? And they selected a kid named Lopez Lemong. Lopez Lemong was a lost boy from the Sudan. When he was six years old, the Jaja weed captured him and was turning him into mm -hmm. a child soldier. And at night, two young boys in his child soldier camp grabbed him up and said, you cannot stay here because you will die. And they took him and they ran for four straight days while they hid during the day and ran at night. And they got to the border of Kenya. And the guards accepted Lopez Lemong, but they turned the 12-year-olds back to the Jaja weed. Lopez was in a refugee camp in Kenya. And in 2000, in that refugee camp, he heard about a man who had a car battery and a television attached to it watching the Olympic Games. And he ran seven kilometers each way each day to watch, and he saw a guy named Michael Johnson. Anybody remember Michael Johnson? He had a great 1996 Olympic yeah. Games. He had a great 2000 Games. Long story short, he came back and said, that's who I want to be. About a month later, the United Nations showed up and said, an American family wants to adopt somebody from this camp, but they want you to write an essay as to why you want to be an American. And he said, I want to be an Olympic gold medalist running track for the United States. You know what? They adopted him. He's in upstate New York, his first night there. The family can't find him at 6 o'clock in the morning. They wonder where he is. And they find him outside. He's washing himself with a hose as he's never seen a shower before. So that night, we're walking the night before the, the captains had selected him to carry the flag. And this is what happens. First of all, they tell us, Americans are scrutinized very heavily. Shut your cameras off. Respect the Olympic ceremony. Do not be filming and walking. We're in a ramp as we walked a mile from where we stayed, we got announced as a team. We were 135th in the, in the alphabet for China. We walked a mile to the bird's nest and there were at least a million people outside. By the way, in 2008, their favorite athlete was Kobe because Kobe Bryant was about 15 feet behind our team and they would just scream for him. So we get into the ramp and the ramp is about this dim. The stadium is white, bright light. And Lopez Lemong is about from here to that speaker from us. And as he steps out and he's got the holster, they hand him the American flag. And the, he, point, he pounds the flag into his holster and for whatever reason, a wind hits this flag. He's the only one of us that's standing in the stadium. And it snaps it out with a pop, which echoes back into our ramp. Mm -hmm. The dream team under Krzyzewski, who changed the entire game about them, the NBA players. He said, you will be in the village, you will be on time, you will respect every Olympian, and you will respect the flag. When it pops, Kobe and LeBron and those guys start jumping up and down and thundering off the walls, USA, USA, and so do all the kids, jumping up and down. And about that time, at least half of them start crying. Because for the Olympic team, most of them don't even know they're gonna be on a team until maybe six weeks before the games because you got to make your team, the trials, Olympics, excuse me, swimming, track and field. It is so emotional, I can't even hardly describe it, how what's happened. But here's what happens after we get onto the track. We start walking around, and for those of you to say that, or hear people say people don't respect America, the entire infield breaks rank to see our athletes. They literally break formation to run to the track to see the American team. You know why? Because we're the greatest team in the world, and we're also the greatest country in the world. And everybody knows it. So. Um, so, um, so speaking of character, I've got a character building moment tonight. I take the 1115 uh, red eye tonight. 
uh, to Pittsburgh for the Team Red, White, and Blue Board of Directors meeting. So last question. Um, you know that you are not going to get away without uh, getting this question here, but based upon your current position and your, your current role um, in HHS, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for philanthropy to help improve American health care? Yeah, so look, the, the, this is obviously a much longer conversation. I'm sure I already bored you to tears, but I spent my entire life in healthcare. The reason why health, we do not have, so we talk about coverage and insurance, right? That's been a pretty big argument, the Affordable Care Act, right? Anybody heard about that one? <laughs> we are in a perpetual cycle of financing failures that will continue to accelerate. There's a reason for that. In 1965, when Medicare came into being, it was a noble attempt to deal with a population problem that had never existed in the history of the human race. In 1900, the average white American male lived to be 45. We were suddenly facing a large number of elderly people in large numbers that had never existed anywhere on the planet before because we had eliminated most infectious diseases. We now had penicillin, and we had 65-year-old mm -hmm. people who needed places to live and they needed healthcare because at some point in time, you start to get sick. So the idea behind Medicare was favorable, it was positive. But the incentive was bad. The incentive was something we call cost plus. We told everybody who would be a Medicare provider in the United States, if you submitted your cost to us, we'll pay you using these generally accepted accounting principles. This, at the beginning, looked like Monty Python's 100 meter dash for men with bad direction. When the gun went off, everybody went in a different direction, right? So today, for example, because of that cost differential, uh, we have prices that are as much as three and 400% different for the identical procedures across the United States. Now, Ronald Reagan came into office in 1981, elected in 1980, and his budget director said at the current pace of growth of Medicare, which was cost plus, which meant you got paid if you spent money, I wonder, by the way, anybody here's buying habits would change if you got reimbursed by your family or anybody else based on how much money you spent, right? You might change your buying habits. Well, that's how we ran healthcare. Stockman said to Ronald Reagan, if we keep this up, we will bankrupt, not Medicare, the United States by the mid-1990s. So they started something called diagnostic related groups and they tamped down the Medicare pricing. By the way, the managers of the America, Medicare Trust Fund have done a great job. I've looked at the data, I just looked at it yesterday. We are fully solvent, meaning that we have revenue to cover Medicare as it relates to its actual expense fully through 2029. Here's the problem. We started this problem by creating a cost plus system, revved up the bus, got everyone on it, in 1982 we pulled the Keenaw Reeves. We jumped out of the driver's seat onto the tarmac and everybody went with the bus. We got out. Today, in the state of California, total knee replacement under Medicare is about 17,000. Your private pay money, dollars, is about 57,000. Net, not gross. So what happens with incentives is they work all too well. We created the smartest, most effective, and largest intelligent oligopoly on the planet with US healthcare. Providers, payers, drug companies, device manufacturers, by the way, they celebrate the holidays, they love their children, and they're not bad people. But they took, right, this is an industrial oligopoly. Consumers have no choice about price. And by the way, it worked. Because if they could pass this price increase on, they would make more money. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't want your margins to look too good, so what happens is you do things like you raise your salary. The average CEO of a large health system 25 years ago made about 450,000. Today they make between three and five million. It's a good way to keep your margins looking okay. So we've increased these costs based on the incentives. The incentives have worked too well. We will face an increasing cycle of the collapse of the financing system if we don't get the cost in line. Let me be specific. The cost of the average American to, for the average American today for health care is $10,700. The next closest Western country in the world is $4,700. It's a cost plus system. And it's growing at a rate which is outstripping wages. The average S&P 500 company, two years ago, grew their revenue 1.5% in their earnings, about six productivity improvements, reducing people, passing on your health care costs. If your health care costs are growing at seven or eight, what do you do with them? You pass them on to individuals. 
So that's why the average wage earner today, family of four, has a premium and copay responsibility which has just crossed the line of $21,000. If the average family of four makes 60 and your net after tax expenses for your health care is 21, you're probably not going to make it very long. That's what causes the increasing collapse of the cycle of financing failure. The net result of which is when those financing failures hit, we go through another cycle of debate about how we're going to finance it. The right answer is cost management. So I'm in deeply involved today, which I, st I started this inside HHS, a transparency project. The idea behind the transparency project would be to allow consumers to be able to price shop and industrial buyers to price shop. Because guess what? Price shopping works. With the exception of perhaps buying a yacht or maybe even a small island or perhaps a country, the average middle class person can buy just about anything as the same price as Bill Gates. Shouldn't that be true for healthcare? I think so. So I think we can solve it, but we need to have some industrial might behind it. So, and the political will to do it. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Good stuff. Yeah.